The 6 o'clock news starts right now. How to get young people to vote. According to the U.S. Census, voters over the age of 65 cast a majority of the ballots during midterm elections. And back here at home, civic leaders are pushing to get more young people out to the polls in more ways than one. KSAT's Elisa Cole visited a Northside ISD high school today to find out how they're doing it. This November, San Antonians will be heading to the polls to cast their ballots. And there's one group of voters in particular that community leaders are grooming for the polls. These kids that are turning 18 are literally the future of our country. Northside ISD's Holmes High School has two volunteer deputy registrars. One of them is math teacher James Hamrick. He's on a mission to register as many eligible students as possible before the deadline, October 11th. Last year, Hamrick registered nearly 80 students. I'm planning on setting up some tables in the cafeteria during all of our lunches uh, and getting some announcements and so all the kids know that I'm out there and getting some kids, getting the current kids that will be 18 by election day um, to come and register to vote. The Secretary of State's office releasing a list on Thursday of 269 high schools across the state requesting voter registration application and cards. 13 of those schools are in San Antonio. Northside ISD ordered 10,000 voter registration applications alone, distributing hundreds to their 12 high schools across the district. Leaders like Hamrick are also encouraging young people to get involved. We highly encourage students who are not 18 yet, but they want to get involved in the election process. Go volunteer to be a clerk. Help check people in at the voting place. Officials tell us they are in need of up to 1,500 election clerks, 16 and older. The pay is $15 an hour. September is actually National Voter Registration Month, so it's a time to celebrate voter registration. It's a time to educate people about voter registration. For more details on how you can get paid to be an election clerk for the upcoming November 8th election day, visit our website at ksat.com. Alyssa Cole, KSAT 12 News. New at six for two years now, the city's annual Martin Luther King March, the largest in the country, has been either modified or canceled because of the pandemic. Well, now as the city council prepares a budget for the upcoming year, the commission organizing that march wants the city to kick in more in its budget. Garrett Berger talks with them about the costs that weigh on them. With a hundred grand earmarked for the MLK commission and the proposed budget, Commission members and supporters of the annual march it organizes are calling for more, three times away. more. I'm going to walk away with my march said $300,000, $300,000. Thank you, Ms. Tippins. The commission's budget chair says the stage alone for the MLK march cost about $110,000. And including some of the associated events, the march in all costs about $220,000, likely more now. It's basically the march because you're talking about the speaker, that's not even in there. A noted speaker, you're going to be looking at anywhere from thirty dollars to $50,000 for just the speaker alone. Lede says the commission is about more than the march. It's meant to commemorate Dr. King's legacy year-round, including with scholarships it provides. $100,000 is great. We appreciate it, but we really need more to truly do what the city wants us to do. It's not just a, a weekend thing. Councilman Jalen McKee Rodriguez, whose District 2 on the east side is the location of the march, plans to recommend bumping the city's contribution to the commission's budget from 100 to 300,000 before the council votes. The question is where it would come from. I think most council members will have significant asks. I think this is a very small one. And so I'm hopeful that we might even be able to do this without uh, without having to take money from anywhere else. The city council is scheduled to vote on a final budget next Thursday. Gary Berger, KSAT 12 News. They are pills that can kill. Nearly 400 fentanyl-laced pills were taken off the streets in San Marcos. Hayes County authorities making that announcement today in a press conference after the death toll of fentanyl overdoses this year rose to five. Some of those deaths among students. Two suspected distributors have been arrested and charged. Alicia Barrera now with why the number of suspects and the number of deaths could keep rising in Hayes County. A fourth student at Hayes CISD has died due to fentanyl poisoning. A bad batch has entered a community, a large stockpile of drugs that is laced with too much fentanyl is now in Hayes County. So far this year, the city of Kyle has reported seven fentanyl overdose deaths. San Marcos reported five. 
Ace County authorities are now warning surrounding communities to be vigilant of counterfeit Percocet pills. It's typically a light blue pill. It's stamped with M30 on it. Our indication so far in the investigation is that it is coming from the greater Austin area, and then the, the Austin intelligence shows that uh, many of those are coming across our border. A weeks-long investigation led authorities to the arrest of two suspected fentanyl distributors, including 20-year-old Anthony Perez Rios, who, according to San Marcos police, admitted to regularly supplying teens with fentanyl pills. At the time of his arrest, he also had in his possession at his residence a shotgun and a rifle, and he had nearly 400 counterfeit Percocet pills containing fentanyl. Those were ready for deadly distribution in our community at the time of his arrest. Suspect number two is a 16-year-old juvenile. The nonprofit Rise Recovery now warning parents and teens should be very concerned. You believe that you're ingesting something that recreationally that is safe for you and you end up dying from a drug overdose. Experts say the best way to be prepared when dealing with fentanyl overdoses is Narcan, an opioid reversal drug. And on KSAT.com, we have a list of free resources, including how you can submit a request for free Narcan. Reporting Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. After more than 70 years on the British throne, Queen Elizabeth II has died. Word coming from the royal family a little after 1230 our time. Her son, now King Charles, and the Queen Consort will stay at Balmoral tonight. They'll return to London tomorrow. All of the United Kingdom in mourning this evening. Hundreds of thousands are expected to pay their respects, with many heading to Windsor Castle for a vigil. Flags at Buckingham Palace and in Washington, D.C. have been lowered to half-staff to honor the passing of the only Queen of England that many people have ever known. Queen Elizabeth transcended generations and her loss being felt around the world and right here in San Antonio. The Queen actually visited the Alamo City in 1991 for a quick stop on a tour of Texas. RJ Marquez is live right now along the Riverwalk where there is still a living memory of her visit, RJ. That's right, Steve and Myra. So we've made our way a little bit south from Mad Dog's British Pub, where we early, were earlier for our 5 p.m. newscast. And over my shoulder right here is a cypress tree that was planted on the River Walk in 1991 to commemorate the Queen's visit here. This tree is officially known as the Queen Elizabeth Cypress, a tribute to a global figure who meant so much to so many people. And that included the owner of Mad Dog's British Pub on the River Walk. Terry Corliss was born and raised about 50 miles outside London and moved to San Antonio in 1991 and is currently in London right now with some of his workers. He told us the country is in absolute shock right now. And back at his pub, we spoke to patrons about what it meant for Elizabeth to be a global leader and why there is such a fascination with the British royal family around the world. They're so fancy, they're wonderful, and they have the traditions, they haven't strayed away from those traditions, and it's never the popular thing, it's just what they really stick to. A great show of power that, you know, especially with everything going on, at least in our country right now, that a woman can maintain a power like that for so long and be such a well-respected and well-loved leader. She was a woman of integrity, uh, she was a monarch, uh, a one-off monarch of great respect, and, and it's... it's, it's it's sad. Very sad. All right, Terry Corliss there, the CEO and owner of Mad Dogs, obviously getting very emotional, a lot of people emotional around the world. And we've seen people here on the River Rock paying their respects, taking photos over at Mad Dogs with a cardboard cutout of Queen Elizabeth. And again, guys, more than 30 years ago, there were thousands of San Antonians that lined the river's bank right here to just get a glimpse of royalty. The Queen here was showered with songs from Rosita Fernandez, mariachi music, and much more. Steven Myra, back to you guys. Thank you, RJ. By the way, ABC will have much more on the Queen's passing from 7 until 10 o'clock tonight, right after the show. Meanwhile, let's check out Loop 410 at McCullough. I believe we're looking at the eastbound traffic here. There's an accident on Starcrest, which seems to be backing up traffic. But again, 410 at McCullough, you can see a big slowdown in what we believe are the eastbound lanes of Loop 410. This month, KSAD community helping with a race near and dear to our hearts. Head for the cure. This year will be the ninth annual 5K run walk that raises funds and awareness for those in our community dealing with brain tumors and their families. Erica Hernandez has more on how this race started and why it continues to give back to so many.
three, two, one. Year after year, the Boyle family laces up their shoes and runs or walks in memory of Jim Boyle. I think it's also just a, a part of us just, well, missing him, number one, and just he was such a part of us. Jim was Kate's at 12's former news director who was diagnosed with a brain tumor after suffering a seizure in September of 2013. The inoperable glioblastoma tumor later caused a brain bleed, and Jim died six months after being diagnosed. Oh, if you haven't been through it, maybe it's hard to understand. So um, it's just, I think it's important to have to have a well-known community out there for support um, for people going through the same thing. Jim's daughter, Erin, helped bring Head for the Cure to San Antonio, and in 2014, the race kicked off right outside KSAT 12 Studios, not only in Jim's memory, but in memory of all those who are battling or who have passed from brain cancer. It is a great way to celebrate loved ones who have been through a lot and to celebrate the community that forms around them. Nine years later, the race is still raising money and awareness, and Team Boyle over the years has raised more than $100,000. And again, this year's race route will go right here in front of KSAT 12. Registration is now open and will be open all the way until race day on September 24th. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. We still miss Jim Boyle. Right now, you can get $5 off registration with the promo code KSAT. You can find the info on how to register on KSAT.com. We hope to see you there. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a look outside with live cam right now. A few more clouds out there today. Just no real action from them? Uh, we, a little bit. Just a, a little few bit. little showers, okay. that 10 to 20% we were talking about, oh, that's what we got. Just minimal coverage. The last little shower that we talked about at 5 o'clock has already dissipated, nothing left over. But there's a little bit of a boundary we're detecting here through Kirby and basically toward about Castle Hill southeastward toward China Grove. And that could help develop or kickstart one or two showers in the time being, but I think odds are against it. Otherwise, you look at the big picture and not much happening out there. Outflow boundary, Gonzales to Flores. We'll see if that develops anything, but it's unlikely. And for the most part, the showers have come to an end. You have to get closer to the Gulf Coastline, and even McMullen County is where we have a few isolated pop-ups that will be very brief in nature. Temperatures right now, right around 90. 93 Converse, 89 Rio Medina, 90 Canyon Lake in this evening. We'll see the temperatures fall through the 80s into the 70s. These rain chances coming to an end by sunset, but the newest drought monitor is in. You're going to like what we have to show you, and we'll compare it to a few weeks ago, see what kind of improvements we made in just a bit. The police say a threat at New Braunfels High School was not credible and no one is hurt, but it still brought a very large response. You never know when we're going to get the call. The resources called in before officers cleared the campus tonight on the night beat at 10. Before we get to weather here, we want to mention we've got some breaking news that we're tracking down some details on a shooting reported in Uvalde. This is at Uvalde Memorial Park. Uvalde police reporting a shooting there with victims. They don't know exactly who was involved. Uh, not said to be an active scene, but Sky 12 is en route. We're trying to gather some more details. But Uvalde police again reporting that shooting at Uvalde Memorial Park and asking people to stay away from that area. Yeah, and I was just trying to get a better look at the map to try to figure out where Uvalde Memorial Park is. Uh, it is off the main road there in Uvalde. Of course, we're going to continue to monitor the situation, but uh, certainly your stomach falls when you hear shooting in Uvalde. So we hope to have more information on that momentarily. All right, let's turn to the weather now to get an update on what's going on outside and potentially more rain that we're always looking for, Adam. Yeah, we're always looking for more rain. I think the odds tomorrow will be similar to what we had today. Just a couple of little pop up showers. Still some activity on the radar. Not a lot to talk about. You go east of town. Outflow boundary from Gonzales down toward up with almost Floresville. We'll see if that kick starts anything. I doubt it's going to. Hallettsville just had one brief shower and even one shower east of Hallettsville right now. Earlier today, we did have just a few little streaky showers move through parts of San Antonio. And just like yesterday, far west side of town, right around and along 1604 and even extreme southern Bear County stretching into Atascosa County. But far west side, 
along 1604 up to about a quarter to maybe a half inch in a few very lucky locations, but otherwise that was it. All right, the drought monitor. This is three weeks ago. Take this in, take a second to look at it. Notice that really dark color on the screen and even that dark red indi indicating the worst drought categories. Now we move to today. Big improvement. We have erased a significant portion of the extreme and exceptional drought over the past three to four weeks. It's good to see this improvement. And now even less of Texas is considered in drought. 62% of Texas is in drought right now. We're seeing that drought erode East Texas and especially deep South Texas continue to chip away at it. Obviously we have more work to do, but this is really nice to see the three week change in the very worst category. The exceptional drought it's down 26%. Extreme drought is down 27% over the past three weeks. So it's good to see that. All right, here's a look at the satellite and radar quiet across the state right now. Obviously we had a few showers and we still have this this upper level swirl over New Orleans that counterclockwise swirl with the north wind on the back side of it where we are that could still trigger an isolated or stray shower for a few folks tomorrow. But I stress very few folks. Most of the energy in action is going to be on the east side of it, closer to Florida. And we still have Hurricane K. This is just basically moving right along the western coast of the Baja Peninsula. Category one hurricane and over the next couple of days gradually dissipate and weaken as it moves northward closer to California, but not really making landfall. But nonetheless, it will continue to throw rainfall into the desert of Southern California, and it's an unusual or unique situation for them. It's not unheard of, but it's not every season that they get a few inches of rain from a hurricane or tropical storm, but they'll get some rain thrown their way. Otherwise around here, about a 10 to 20% chance tomorrow and then nothing and pretty repetitive weather from there on out. All right, take a look at the tropics. Hurricane Earl, category two, just south of Bermuda. That's head to the northeast, uh, likely to be category three. And then we have another area of disturbed weather over the central Atlantic, and that's got the 70% likelihood of becoming our next tropical system, not next tropical cyclone, then a 30% chance for a wave that's just coming off of Africa. Take a look at our sky today. You see those clouds bubbling up. Only a few of them dropped some brief rain. 94, that was our high. The average is 92. The record 101 set back in 1993. And even our morning low of 73 wasn't far from the average of 72. Now we're at 91. Dew point is 63, so it feels like one degree warmer than the actual air temperature. Alpine 81. Abilene 92, Lubbock at 88 degrees. Notice for the most part, we're near 90 across most of the state with many locations, even in the 80s. And our high temperatures aren't going to change much in the days ahead. Let's talk about tomorrow. Here's your case at 12 hour forecast. 8 a.m. 75 degrees by noon. We make it up right near 90, a lot of sunshine and then 95 for the afternoon high. So really anywhere from about 92 in Comfort and Kerrville to 94 in Divine and even Gonzales as well. Then it's pretty repetitive, just sunshine and mid 90s every day. Thank you, Adam. I want to clarify uh, where this call is coming in from Uvalde. It is Uvalde Memorial Park. That is actually near the Civic Center in Uvalde. If you know where that is, it is not the Town Square Plaza where a lot of the memorial crosses were set up around that fountain there. It is not close to Rob Elementary either. It is actually close to the uh, Sergeant Staff Sergeant Willie De Leon Civic Center, which was a gathering place right after that shooting. So get continuing to monitor the shooting out of Uvalde. Yeah, as we get more information on that, let's turn now to sports. Larry Ramirez joining us here in the studio. And anytime we can talk Manu, it's a good time. It's always a great time to talk Manu. It's never right? a bad time. San Antonio loves Manu, and Manu will go into the Hall of Fame Saturday night. Our Greg Simmons is live in Massachusetts, and Manu is talking about his 2005 championship with the Spurs and a big game coverage to Hennis will play Friday night, which is unusual for them coming up.
When Manu Ginobili was drafted in 1999 by the Spurs, he was so far off the NBA's radar that Rod Thorne, then an NBA executive, didn't know how to say Manu's last name, calling him Gino Beely. When announcing the Spurs pick, Manu Ginobili is now a household name, though, and he's hours away from being a basketball Hall of Famer. Let's go live to Springfield, where Greg Simmons has yeah. more. You know, that is just a great story. Thank you, Larry. Welcome to Massachusetts for the 2022 Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame in Shryman Weekend, where Manu, Manu Ginobili will become the fourth Spurs player to reach the highest honor you can have in pro basketball. And it's not just because of what the second-round draft pick did for the Spurs as far as NBA championships in 2003, 2005, 2007, and 2014. It's also for his accomplishments as an international player as well. He won a EuroLeague title, was named MVP in 2001, led Argentina to a gold medal in 2004, was the NBA Sixth Man of the Year award winner in 2008, becomes the second member of the Big Three, Tim Duncan being the first, to get this call to the hall. So when did the Argentinian turn pro basketball star know he finally felt he truly belonged in the NBA? It's when I realized that year that I belonged, that I was going to do good, that I, I, I internally started to feel different, right? From all the uncertainties of my rookie season, my second year, to say, okay, I made it. Now I gotta have another role. I'm being respected in a different way. I'm more of a leader of this team, and and my mindset shifted, confidence-wise. Right, uh, I started to walk straighter and looking everybody on the eyes, and and not feeling like an outsider as, as before I was. All right, Manu will be arriving here in Springfield tonight along with Fabrizio Berto, Bruce Bowen, and then on this weekend, David Robinson, Greg Popovich, and of course, Tony Parker will all be here for the big ceremony. And remember, so is former Spur player George Carl going into the Hall of Fame, but not as a player, as a coach. We'll have more coming up tonight live on the Night Beat. Live from Springfield, Massachusetts, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. Greg, our BGC road trip tomorrow night will start with the Junction Eagles playing at number 12 to Hennis, where the Cowboys are playing a rare Friday night home game. Coach Langfield said due to a scheduling conflict, Junction agreed to play tomorrow night instead. So we asked Coach to explain the Saturday home game tradition. It was a tradition started a long time ago because of our neighbors. Everybody wanted to go to the neighboring games like Hondo game. The Hondo game was a big draw for like our fans because everybody supports both communities and it's eight miles away. <laughs> So what happened was it ended up being one of those things where we play on Saturday night and Hondo play on Friday night, so then everybody could make both games. Yeah, I do, I do think it's going to be weird. Normally we play our home games on Saturday. Just It's kind of a tradition around here. and I, We might have played a home game on Friday before, but it's been a while, so it's going to be pretty weird. All right. We're used to playing uh, our home games on Saturdays and on the road on Friday, so it's kind of exciting, though. It's, it's a different feeling, but eh. We're still going to go out there and play. It's going to be different. We've never, we have probably, but it's been a while. I think it's going to be a good change. I like playing on Fridays. It's going to be a good game I'm ready for. No, sir. It's going to be, we're going to come ready to take care of business, and, you know, we're going to walk out of here on Friday night with the win. The Hennis will host Junction tomorrow night at 7. Hey, if you're looking for the BGC streaming schedule for this week, please scan the QR code on your screen. It will show you the games and how to stream them. Appreciate it. You're Thank welcome. you, Larry. No problem. All right, we want to go back now to what we're learning out of Uvalde. Uh, we now have been told that it is not a dangerous situation. This shooting reported at Memorial Park in Uvalde. Our Lee Waldman was talking with some authorities there. The police department, they have said that this is not something that is currently a threat to the public. No one needs to shelter in place. This call came out about 530 for a shooting at Memorial Park in Uvalde. Yeah, Memorial Park near the Civic Center in Uvalde. It is not the park where the crosses were set up uh, to remember the 21 victims from Robb Elementary shooting and it was not it's not at Robb Elementary. It is actually along Main Street, but it over closer to the Civic Center. We have a crew on the way. We'll update you as soon as we can. Of course, we'll continue to follow this online and on air. We'll be right back. 
It is the biggest story of the day, the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, someone who ruled for 70 years. A lot of people have never known another queen of England. So we're going to talk about that and what this means going forward in today's KSAT Q&A with Trinity professor Dr. Peter O'Brien, teaches political science there at Trinity. Uh, Dr. O'Brien, thank you for being here. I if, want to first put this in perspective for Americans for you know we don't have a monarchy so people might look at this as somewhat like celebrity news but this is much more than that it's much more significant explain why well thank you for the invitation uh, well she was formerly the sovereign uh, the, the, the center of political power at least formally uh, she was a constitutional monarch, so she lived within the bounds of a constitution. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I think I think of what Prime Minister Liz Truss said today. Uh, and think about that for a minute. <laughs> the United Kingdom got a new prime minister and a new king in two, two days' time. Uh, but anyway, Liz Truss said she was the rock on which modern uh, Britain was built. And I think that one of the reasons for that was that she had an extraordinary uh, and self-sacrificing commitment to duty. Even as a 14-year-old girl, as, as a presumptive heir, before she was queen, she would make radio addresses to soothe the fears of the kids during World War II who had to be evacuated. Um, at 21, she said she would commit her whole life to serving as the the monarch once she became that uh, and um she really she really did that she was extraordinarily dedicated to the duties of the monarchy um and that meant a lot of travel a lot of entertaining and all these kinds of things the other thing i think that was part of that rock of was um her resolute insistence on being non-partisan she was was absolutely adamant that the, that the crown be above politics. And so uh, that could be very unifying at times uh, because she never took political sides. Um, <clears throat> quite in contrast, by the way, to her great grandmother, Victoria, right, who reigned for 63 years, who was known to meddle in, mm. in politics. But, um, so I think that those were uh, distinguishing features of her, that she's a lot more than a celebrity, right? Yeah. It, 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 when you think of just the prime ministers that she oh. would meet with, I mean, Winston Churchill, Margaret Thatcher, and, and most recently Boris Johnson, I mean, and all the, the world events that she lived through and, and reigned through, I mean, it, it, it's mind-boggling to and 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 i talked to to one of my friends who who uh is is from england and he said you know i'm gonna have to learn a new uh a new anthem now instead yeah. of you know god save the queen they're gonna have to learn a new anthem now so god i mean save it, the it, king it sounds weird doesn't it <laughs> yeah so it's it's all you know there's it's a real question mark about the monarchy in england and what happens now is charles the 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 answer uh, does 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 he decide? You know, wh where do we go from here? What kind of king will Charles be? Yeah, you know, Char he is the king now, um, and uh, Charles decided to keep the name Charles the Third. Sometimes they get to give themselves new names, but he kept Charles the Third. Um, yeah, you know, there's there's kind of ep optimism and pe pessimism. Optimism that he will be a more modern on a forward-looking king in the sense of, for instance, he's a strong environmentalist. Um, he, one of the uh, titles of the monarch is defender of the faith, and he has said, I will be called defender of the faiths, with, with a plural, so he'd be more inclusive, like the large Muslim, there's a, you have a picture of that, large Muslim population. Um, he's talked about opening up the palaces so the public can come in. Uh, on the other hand, the pessimism is that he's not as popular as his beloved mother. Uh, he was in, involved in the scandalous affair with Camilla, his wife and now queen consort, um, and the, the, the terrible treatment of, of, of Princess uh, Diana. Um, <clears throat> so 
if Britain is facing hard times, for instance, which looks like that will happen with Brexit and with the uh, bans on trade with Russia, <clears throat> then uh, people might not want to have $124 million of taxes going to keeping up the royal households. You could see a revival in the 80s. There was some talk about uh, abolishing the monarchy. I, I don't think that's likely to happen. But if it were to, to happen, then he might want to take a step like advocate and give over the uh, the monarchy to his his more popular son and his wife Kate, uh, Prince uh, Prince William. I don't know, but those are pretty far fetched. I what would it take? I mean, what kind of step needs to happen for a monarchy to be abolished? Yeah, it would be um, it would have to be done by Parliament in an act of Parliament, um, and. Uh, that's all it takes, though. It's just a, a vote, a majority of parliament uh, to abolish the monarchy. We go back to Queen Elizabeth, uh, Professor. I, I, we're watching here from her from her jubilee, and and this is a woman who, like you said, in the '80s, there was a movement to abolish the monarchy when she was in power. But I think as the years have gone by, she's become more and more popular. And there are a lot of people in San Antonio who feel like they have a personal connection with her. I don't know if it's from the visit yeah. that she had here in the 90s or it's from shows like The Crown and the documentaries and things like that. So there are this this is a loss that's being felt here as well. Yeah, and it's all, even though she was very formal most of the time, she did have a humorous side. I'm sure no one can forget when she <laughs> Yeah, came into the Olympics with uh, James Bond, 007, uh, with right. Daniel Craig, and they, they filmed this and made it look as if she parachuted into the Olympics from a, <laughs> uh, from a helicopter in the opening ceremonies. So she, she did have a, a, a humorous side and could make some fun of herself. Then. Dr. O'Brien, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate you being here this evening. You're welcome. Thanks for the invitation. And just to let you know, ABC will have three hours of coverage on the Queen's passing starting right after this show. We'll be right back. I want to get back to that breaking news out of Uvalde, a shooting there at Memorial Park. We have now learned our Lee Waldman confirming with Uvalde police that one teenager has been injured and they are currently looking for two suspects. We were also told by the police department this is not an active threat to the community. No one is in danger at the moment. No one being asked to shelter in place. Again, one teen injured and now they're looking for two people. It's just been updated. Two teenagers ah. have now been shot. They're looking for one person. Uh, again, they're describing this as not a dangerous situation, but the fact that this comes just a little over three months after the shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde is certainly something that um, gets your attention. And we have a crew on the way. Again, the last check, two people injured, a suspect on the loose. They believe they are all three juveniles. We'll continue to follow this situation. Of course, have the very latest on the night beat at 10. Let's take a look outside with live cam right now. It's a nice picture out there, but just no rain if you're looking for that. However, that drought monitor, that was encouraging, Adam. Yeah, very encouraging. And we've had big improvements over the past several weeks. And you know what? Might as well take a look at it again in case you missed it a little bit earlier. Right now, the shower activity is closer to the coastline, especially around Corpus Christi. That's where we have a severe thunderstorm warning. But even within our viewing area, McMullen County, and you even head a little closer to George West, we're talking right around uh, Choke Canyon Reservoir there. Otherwise, we're dry around town right now. We're going to take a look at our forecast and, uh, again, the updated drought monitor and look at the tropics in just a bit. All right, some people got some rain today, but it wasn't as widespread as yesterday, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, it was mainly far west side of San Antonio, and then uh, even far south side, that was about it, and not a whole lot. 10% chance again tomorrow, 10 to 20%, basically just like what we saw today. You may get a brief downpour, odds are against it, and you could see one off in the distance as well. Let's talk about the rainfall so far this month. 
0.98 inches. Not bad, we've had nearly an inch so far this month, and that's just a little, a hair below average, eight hundredths of an inch below average. And keep in mind, August ended right near average for precipitation measured at the airport. Now, since January 1st, we've had 8.2 inches, and that's about 13 and a half inches below average for overall precipitation. We have to look at this again. Okay, drought monitor three weeks ago and the drought monitor now. We just wiped away a good chunk of the extreme and exceptional drought. Yes, we still have a lot, especially where a good portion of our population is located, Bear County and surrounding counties. We have some more work to do. We need to chip away at it even more but we've had big improvements and the entire state has had huge improvements just over the past three to five weeks, not just here, but elsewhere. So this is good to see. We had a little bit of shower activity, especially closer to the Gulf Coast today. And as I mentioned, a couple of them popped up here and there in and around San Antonio, especially the west side. What's happening is we've got this northerly flow on the back side of this upper level low. This is a cutoff low, so it's cut off from the main push and flow in the atmosphere. So it's just spinning right now. It will eventually get shoved eastward, but that's not until this weekend. In turn, tomorrow, a similar situation. A little bit of energy in that northerly flow can't rule out a couple of showers from developing. Unique situation for folks in Southern California. Even Baja Peninsula has seen some heavy rainfall and more on the way. Because of Hurricane K, Category 1 hurricane did make landfall on the extreme western edge of the uh, of Baja Peninsula, kind of that horn there on the west side. And it's likely to go right along the edge of the coast in the days ahead, but very slowly. So bringing more rain, more flooding potential and a handful of inches possible in parts of the desert of Southern California. And remember, they average about four to four and a half inches per year and they could see close to that or even more than that in some parts of the desert in Southern California. So a unique situation for them. Not unheard of, but unique. Then we have Hurricane Earl near B Bermuda. Category two likely to become a category three. Uh, Danielle is just a remnant low pressure system right now. Nothing tropical in terms of what we had with Danielle in the North Atlantic. Two areas we're watching in the Eastern and Central Atlantic. First of all, 70% chance of development here in the Central Atlantic and then a 30% chance of development just off the coast of Africa. Here's a look at our time lapse today. Not bad. We had some of those clouds building, but not a whole lot of them dropped much in terms of real rain. 94 the high temperature, the average being 92, the record. 101 set back in 1993. 91 right now, dew point is 63, so it feels like it's one degree warmer. And across the state, for the most part, 80s to low 90s. An even 80 in Alpine, but 92 in Abilene, 90 in Amarillo, 91 officially right now in San Antonio, and some locations already down in the 80s. Now, gradually, we'll make it in the 70s and even lower 70s by tomorrow morning, 7 a.m., 73 by the noon hour. We're up to 89, a lot of sunshine, I think, to kickstart the day. And then those puffy cumulus clouds developing with that 10 to 20% chance of a stray shower by the afternoon. 95, the high temperature. Halotus about 91, Seguin 94, Floresville 93 degrees, and Sabinal 94. Looking ahead, very repetitive forecast here. We're talking mostly sunny to partly cloudy, and after tomorrow, just dry in general. It's gonna be hard to come by rain in the days ahead, and high temperatures remaining in the mid 90s. One thing of note, you will notice some slightly less humidity during the afternoon starting this weekend. Don't you forget, it is Therm Thurs, and I want to take you the next step in the thermometer making process. Now, we've been going through how I've put together and assembled, and we'll blew the glass filled with alcohol, sealed, and then exercise these thermometers. They work, they work great. They're good, rowdy thermometers, but What's the temperature? That's the hard part. So yes, they work. We see the alcohol go up and down. It changes with temperatures, but what's the actual temperature? That's the hard part. And this is where precision comes into play. It's time to calibrate, my friends. Yes. I just we, like that you called them good rowdy. Rowdy uh, thermometers. They're rowdy therms. Okay. So calibration, one definition here, providing the instrument with a known standard input of a previously established accuracy and recording its response.
basically compare it to a really good thermometer and record the results. So I'm gonna have to put it in four different temperature environments from about zero degrees Fahrenheit, that is, to about 32 to room temperature, then all the way up to above 100. So over a 100 degree range and note the level on the glass and note the temperature as well. And then I can generate a scale and then that would be the calibration. There's a lot more to talk about with the calibration and boy oh boy you got to be exact and precise with that in order to get an accurate thermometer. Anyway, Gail McGraw of San Antonio, the winner of this week's homemade thermometer. Go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. You know, it looks so easy. Oh yeah, you just blow the glass, fill it up, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Then you got to calibrate it. Yeah, and that is a challenge. These yeah. therms don't get rowdy by themselves. Oh no, they you know? don't, Myra. Okay. I took the words right calibrate out of my mouth. Calibrate good times. Come on. <laughs> we'll be right back. All right, we're getting some more information about that shooting in Uvalde happening almost 90 minutes ago at this point at Uvalde Memorial Park. Two teens injured, one suspect on the run. We're told that Uvalde police do know who they are looking for. Yeah, we're also told the weapon was recovered. We don't know the conditions of the two juveniles right now. They're looking for the one suspect who is also described as a juvenile. Of course, this is three months after the shooting at Robb Elementary. We'll be right back. Give you the latest update now from Uvalde, a shooting at Uvalde Memorial Park. We know two people have been shot. One suspect is on the run, but police know who they are looking for, and they say this is not a dangerous situation. We are gathering more information. Of course, we'll have the very latest on KSAT.com and on the night beat. See you at 10.